sober. He also tried to get sober because he was hoping for a long-term relationship with someone. And he met some gay guys who were also trying to be sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. So he quit drinking for a few months. However, this did not last a long time, unfortunately. And in 1977, Paul Bateson started binge drinking again, and this time was even worse than before. He would later admit that he would drink almost a liter, one liter of vodka a day at this time. And he also said that this really made his social life go downhill. Because he would never have energy to go anywhere. Because he would always be drunk. So he would rarely go out. But when he did go out, he would often visit leather bars. And these were extremely popular for gay people in the 70s. I think they might be popular now too, I'm not sure, but these are bars where mostly gay people would come and hang out and they would wear leather jackets for these bars. And Paul was one of those people that would dress up in leather jackets with his friends and visit the bars. So one of the days when Paul went out to the bars, he ended up meeting a reporter for Variety magazine. His name was Addison Farrell. Addison actually liked Paul and he decided to buy him a drink at the bar and this is how they started talking. They did a lot of drugs that day and cocaine and they drank a lot as well. So they bar hopped until about 6 in the morning when Addison invited Paul Bateson to his apartment. And at the apartment they continued to drink and do more drugs. And at about 7.30 a.m. is when they had sex. So after sex, Addison let Paul know that he doesn't want any long-term relationship with him. This was just a one-night stand. He didn't want anything to do with him, pretty much. And Paul hated the, the rejection. He could not believe what he was hearing. And he later confessed that he needed money as well because he didn't have a job. He was not working and any money that he would have, he would spend it all on alcohol. So Paul ended up finding a skillet in Addison's house and beating Addison with the skillet. Then he found a knife and stabbed Addison several times. And I'm thinking there was no struggle because Addison was completely passed out at this time. So he couldn't really protect himself. After the murder, Paul took all the money from Addison's wallet, which wasn't much. And he also took his credit card, his passport. I'm not sure why he needed his passport. also took some of the nicer clothes from his closet and he left the apartment but he ended up stopping by a liquor store and buying himself some alcohol on the money that he stole from Addison.
citizen and went home and was drunk the rest of the day. So police did believe that the killer knew Addison since there was no forced entry and police thought that the motive was to rob Addison because some of the valuable things were stolen. However, Addison had a lot of expensive stuff and musical equipment in his apartment that none of it was stolen, which was very odd if the motive was to rob him. There were a lot of other murders in the area at this time in New York. Murders of gay men. There were crews of murders and a journalist and writer by the name of Arthur Bell who was the writer for The Village Voice a newspaper for Greenwich Village in New York wrote an article about how these cases often go unnoticed because they're gay men and the killer is never found and he mentioned the case of Addison Verrill as well he said that this issue is never taken seriously by police because these men are gay. Arthur Bell was an activist, a gay activist, and he was actually a really good friend of Paul Bateson. At the end of the article, Arthur Bell provided a phone number to NYPD's Homicide Bureau for anyone that has information regarding any of these killings and especially Addison Verrill's killing. at Christopher 
Forest Street bar where he met Addison Verrill, who bought him a drink. As they bar hopped all night, they eventually ended up at a bar called Mineshaft. And at this bar, Addison was like a local. Everyone knew him. He even had a, his own chair there, his own table. Caller, most likely Paul, also said that he started noticing how popular Addison was. He didn't even know of his popularity before, but everyone on the streets would recognize him, try to get his autograph. He was popular in bars. And this is when the caller said that he decided he wants to sleep with him that night. Because he wanted to sleep with someone so famous. He further said that he did not like when Addison didn't want a longer relationship with him. After the murder, the scholar said that he took $57 from the wallet of Addison and that would be approximately $255 nowadays. So it's not that much but still pretty good money I guess when you don't have it. He then said that he continued drinking for the rest of the day. And he doesn't remember any anything else of that day. He also started talking about his childhood to Arthur Bell, mentioning that he wanted to become a dancer when he was younger and he was into art when he was younger. And Arthur Bell actually recalled this person saying to Arthur that he doesn't want to turn himself in to the police because he wouldn't be able to practice again and he would get his license taken away or he would lose his license. So Arthur ended up calling police after the conversation and told everything to the police. So he just talked to someone who claimed to be the killer A really big clue was that the fact that the caller said he has a license for something and that he wouldn't be able to practice. This suggested that he must be working somewhere with the law or medicine. Police actually also found it interesting the fact that the caller knew about the stolen credit card and that there was a white substance on the floor at Addison's house which was not released to the public this information and somehow the caller knew about this. So the detectives decided to go the next day to Arthur Bell's house and wait around the same time as the previous day to see if the caller calls again. And there was a phone call at exactly 11 p.m. at Arthur Bell's house. However, the men that called identified themselves as Mitch, a friend of Paul Bateson. This person said that he knows the killer is Paul Bateson. Because Paul Bateson himself called him not too long ago and confessed. And he said that he knew Paul from staying at a detox with him a few months ago. Mitch also said that he wants to meet with Arthur Bell alone and talk about it. But police suggested him not to go anywhere to meet with him. But they did and go arrest Paul Bateson right away at his East 12th Street apartment in New York. And they found him laying on the floor when they came to 
his house. He was so drunk. When they asked Paul if he knows why he is being arrested, Paul just pointed at uh, the Village Voice magazine that was laying on his floor with an open article that was written by Arthur Bell. Actually started suspecting that Paul is the one who killed all these. 
this man. So then he's essentially a serial killer. Paul actually said that prosecutor offered him a deal if he confessed to all those back murders and some other unsolved murders as well. And this way he would receive a lesser sentence. But Paul was debating whether he wanted to accept this deal or not. William Friedkin was actually following the story and this is the director of The Exorcist and he watched the interview and confession of Paul Bateson and this gave him an idea to do a adaptation of infamous novel of the same name by the name of Cruising so the novel was called Cruising and he made a movie called Cruising and this was because of Paul Bateson's trial and this movie is about a detective who goes to gay bars undercover to catch a serial killer the movie has Al Pacino staring as the main character in pre-trial motions Paul with the help of his attorney tried to suppress his confession or prevent it from being shown in trial. His argument was that police did not read him his rights before he confessed and he was really drunk when he confessed so he doesn't remember what he was saying. Paul also denied ever making any phone calls to Arthur Bell. He said it wasn't him. So the trial happened in the early 1979. Both the confession and the article in the Village Voice went into evidence against him in the trial. A friend of Paul Bateson, Richard Ryan, also testified and said that Paul told him about the killing of Addison Verrill and he also bragged about other murders that he mutilated as well. He said that Paul actually told him that Paul Bateson killed six people that were found in the Hudson River. Paul was not found guilty of the Hudson River murders, but he did get 20 years to life for the murder of Addison Verrill. Paul Bateson served 24 years and 3 months and was released from Arthur Kill Correctional Facility on the day after his 63rd birthday in August 2003. In 2018, Esquire writer Matt Miller tried to locate Paul Bateson to interview him. He tried to call him with the phone numbers that he found and they were all disconnected. And he also wrote him letters but all the letters bounced back. They came back. So we don't know where Paul is at this moment. There is a record in Social Security Death Index with Paul Bateson, who has the same Social Security number, who died on September 15th of 2012. However, William Friedkin, 